And it is my great pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Dennis Wilson and Dr. Jean-Baptiste Mouret for this morning class on evolutionary reinforcement learning. Uh, Dr. Wilson is an assistant professor at Isae Supero in Toulouse. Their research is at the frontier between evolutionary computation and neural networks. They have made contribution in particular in genetic programming, uh, neuroevolution, and their application to reinforcement learning problems. They've done research um, at a variety of different places, including MIT and the University of Toulouse before joining ISAE. Uh, Dr. Mouret is a senior researcher at INRIA. He is a leading figure in evolutionary robotics. His research interleaves evolutionary computation, robotics, and data-efficient machine learning. And he's the father of some widely adopted concepts and ideas in the field, uh, in particular, some of which he will be presenting this morning. Uh, he previously was an assistant professor at Sorbonne University before joining in RIA and has received uh, numerous and way too many awards for his research. So this morning, we are really thrilled to welcome you both, Dennis and Jean-Baptiste, for this class on evolutionary reinforcement learning. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, good morning to everyone. So uh, this class would be about evolution and the link with reinforcement, reinforcement learning, but generally how to solve reinforcement learning problems with evolution. So why do, you, why do we want to do this? Uh, first evolution is like uh, the most fascinating algorithms of life to me. Uh, we could say that species evolved uh, by some kind of algorithm. We have iterations like generations. So in real life, there is some kind of uh, iterative process that creates all the diversity of species that we have around us. Uh, it's also a try and error process. So evolution twice things, it explores by mutation. I think you all know uh, the basics for all of this. So there is some exploration and then there is some reward, which is uh, like uh, usually it's something like the number of offsprings uh, that survive, but we can see it in many ways. But essentially, there is some reward that's given to a specific species, and the best species survive. And then overall, by try and error, we get more and more fit species. So in many respects, uh, that's a try and error uh, learning algorithm uh, that exists in nature, that has been widely successful, and that makes it very interesting. So. To me, it solves a try and error learning problem. It's not a reinforcement learning algorithm by itself because it does not necessarily use the formalism of reinforcement learning, but it solves the same problem. So I think it's a very interesting metaphor uh, can give us other ideas. Instead of taking inspiration from how animals and babies learn, uh, we can take inspiration from how species evolve. Uh, and it serves a very long history in computing. And I think evolution was one of the first thing that was actually tried uh, on a computer when they started to program them. Uh, it's probably even older than learning. So of course, in this uh, two hours, we not cover everything. Um, it's a very rich field with tons and tons of ideas. Uh, we just give a very simple overview. So why uh, we want to talk about evolution in that specific school? Uh, first, it's, it's clear to me that evolution can optimize policies in the very same way as we enforcement learning do, especially for control problems. So it's an interesting uh, optimizer. A black box optimizer, we can uh, do multi objective uh, optimization. We'll go back to this later. One very nice feature is that it scales to, par to parallel computers very easily. And I think it's very important nowadays that we have all these uh, very nice multi core computers, uh, GPUs, all these things. They tend to be highly parallel, and this makes sense to have algorithms that are designed for this. And an interesting thing also is that uh, evolution has a very holistic view. So we discard all the intermediate steps. We run some uh, episode, we see how it performs, and we discard everything that is in between. So that means that there is not really credit assignment question uh, because we're not trying to assign credit. Uh, there is no problem with large and continuous states, but of course, because we discard a lot of data, uh, that's not that easy. Uh, in many cases, that also comes with uh, algorithms that are less data efficient. Just to illustrate uh, a few examples here, uh, that's uh, um, 
learning a working policy with an algorithm called CMAS, but uh, Dennis will present just the next. Uh, and uh, in a few generations, so in that case, 2000 generations, uh, you get all these nice working gates. So the, really when we see all the um, nice demonstrations uh, of deep reinforcement learning algorithms, uh, working on Mujoko task, learning, working, and things like this, but something that the evolutionary computation community has been working on for a very long time. So not saying that we do it better, but clearly that's the same problem. So here, for instance, again, uh, another working uh, robot, um, and which is controlled by a neural network, and which is evolved uh, also with CMIS in that case. But also something very interesting that evolution can optimize structures. Uh, so that means we can, and we have been doing for a long time in this community, uh, what we can call the uh, neural architecture search. So trying to evolve the topology of neural networks. We also have been evolving um, uh, morphology. So this is like maybe one of the uh, most famous uh, video of evolution. Uh, it's like uh, more than 25 years old now. Uh, and in that case, so it's a video by Carl Sims. Um, he, he was evolving uh, virtual creatures, so evolving in a physics simulator, so something like Mujoko now. Uh, it was evolving so the morphology and some kind of uh, neural controller at the same time. And you see all this diversity of very nice shapes, but also the nice control. Uh, later in the video, we can see, and we, and we not show the full video, but here it's like a closed loop control. So it's trying, the creature is trying to reach uh, the wet point. So we're very close to many things that we see uh, in modern deep reinforcement learning, especially for control. On the right, you see uh, some uh, neural network that we, for which we evolve the structure, and then there is a recurring pattern. So you see the alternance of red and green. Green is like positive weights, red are negative weights. And you see that we have this 3D substrate of neurons, and there is a repetitive pattern in this. Uh, which is also something that we see in brains. And one of the important questions for evolution has been, how do we do this? How do we evolve something as complicated as a brain? Of course, we don't want one gene for everything. So when we have an architecture, we want it to have some regularity and how we do this. And something that's uh, more recent is very much connected to uh, this school is that uh, we discovered more recently that evolution can be very competitive for deep reinforcement learning uh, problems. So in that case, uh, there are a few papers by OpenAI and UberAI essentially uh, that showed that if we use quite simple evolutionary algorithms, so again, Dennis will present uh, evolutionary strategies in detail uh, just next, but if we use these simple algorithms and we evolve the weights of deep neural networks, so like deep convolutional networks, big networks uh, with many, many weights, we thought that that will not work, that will not scale. Uh, but actually, on many benchmarks, it, it is competitive. It's not necessarily better, uh, but just the fact that a, quite a simple algorithm based on a very different metaphor gives results that sometimes are better and sometimes are similar uh, to state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithm tells us something about that there is something interesting, here, something to, uh, to look at and something to, to think about. So here are a few examples with Atari games uh, that shows that uh, we can evolve deep uh, deep neural networks uh, so the poly as policies for these satellite games from pixels uh, directly uh, with the same hypothesis as deep reinforcement learning algorithms, uh, but using evolution. And I said different uh, metaphor and I think quite a simpler algorithm. So uh, for this morning, uh, we have a very short slot. So we'll um, like to cover a lot of material in two hours. So there's there will be no time really for uh, in-depth experiments. Uh, we selected four topics, uh, which we think are really interesting and can give you uh, new ideas about learning. Uh, the first one is evolutionary strategies. Uh, so I would say that are the most efficient um, optimizers from evolution uh, for black box functions. So we'll uh, describe some of uh, the main ones. Uh, then we want to quickly describe um, Pareto-based multi-objective evolution algorithms, uh, especially NSGA2, uh, which are very interesting because instead of finding like the best policy, it will find the set of all the trade-offs. 
And I think that gives a very different point of view about optimization. And at the end, you don't aggregate uh, your objective with a big cost function with weights that you need to tune. You just get all the trade-offs and then uh, you can choose. You don't need to rewind to make different aggregations and so on. Then I will, uh, so all the two first parts will be given by Denis. Uh, then we'll have one part about neuroevolution in which I will describe uh, some very well-known results in the evolutionary computation community about NEAT and HyperNEAT, uh, which are ways to evolve the architectures and the ways of neural networks. I will not go too far on this because we don't have much time, uh, but I think it's very important that you at least know the main principles here. And then I will have, a, I would give a big part uh, that I call beyond the fitness function, uh, which is more, I think, about what are the main questions of the field right now. Uh, so we explain things about selective pressure, novelty search, and quality diversity, which is closer to the work that I'm doing, but the work that a lot, big part of the community is doing right now, which I think, again, is giving an interesting point of view on many problems that's quite different from what we do in uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, then there will be a keynote uh, given by Sebastian Rizzi from IT University of Copenhagen. The title is Evolving Agents That Learn More Like Animals. Uh, but Sebastian has been doing very, very interesting work that mix evolution, learning, and games. So he's mostly working with video games. In my talk, I will mostly present um, results from robotics, but Sebastian has been applying similar ideas to games. <laughs> and um, just to before uh, even giving the stage to, to Denise, uh, we chose to introduce like a few classic algorithms of the field. So we are far from being exhaustive. So I'm sorry, we'll not cover many things that should have been covered, but in two hours, we cannot do everything. Um, and in many cases, we, we have designed some small notebooks to reproduce the examples of the slides. So it's not like a hand-on class in which you run your notebook and we ask questions about how to fill the notebooks. But I think it's very nice if you can run the notebook yourself on your side. Uh, after the class, or if you can go back to it, then you have all the details and so on. And also that gives us the opportunity to show you actual code, not being too abstract. Uh, just for the question, uh, what's the main difference between reinforcement learning and evolutionary strategies? Uh, I think that could be answered in the class, so that's probably a question for later. Uh, we'll not do it right now. Uh, so I will leave the stage to Denise for the two first parts, so evolutionary strategies and uh, PyTo based which objective evolutionary algorithms. Thanks, Shribi. Uh, so I hope everybody can see my screen just fine. Uh, just a note that I'm uh, presenting a notebook here, and this notebook is available on the GitHub pages uh, website, and there's a collab link uh, on that site. So feel free to play the notebook along as I present uh, this first presentation on evolutionary strategies. So uh, I'm going to start with a very, very simple evolutionary strategy, the one plus one and then the one plus lambda, uh, some of the simplest evolutionary algorithms uh, that there are uh, so that we can really understand the basis of, of what is an evolutionary algorithm, what is an evolutionary strategy. Uh, in this next uh, uh, 40 minutes, I'm hoping to go from that one plus one uh, to CMAES, which is uh, sort of the state of the art evolutionary strategy. Um, we're going to pass through some other ones which work very well for neuroevolution, which work uh, well for applications to reinforcement learning problems. Uh, but uh, the, the end of this is going to be uh, a complexification until the point of CMAES. So I hope you're all ready uh, for the ride. Here we go. So the one plus one evolutionary strategy to build up towards the one plus lambda. The one plus one ES is an incredibly simple algorithm. It's written here. You start with a point X uh, until a certain termination condition, uh, which is a parameter of your algorithm that might be a certain computational limit uh, because you've done enough evaluations. That might be a termination criteria inside the environment. You've reached a sort of maximum fitness. You are going to go through this loop. 
uh, you add some Gaussian noise to your existing x to make x prime. And here we're going to consider that we're in a case of minimizing some sort of objective function. Uh, the, the smaller our objective function, the better. So if f of x prime is less than f of x, then we're going to replace x with x prime. We simply repeat that loop uh, until we meet that termination criterion. So that's the one plus one uh, evolutionary strategy. It doesn't get much more simple than that. And we're going to build on that to get to much more complex evolutionary strategies like CMAES. At each point in the one plus one evolutionary strategy, we sample from a single point. We add a single uh, sample of, of noise to our previous best fitness. We could have a more informed view of the search space by taking more points. Uh, and we'll see exactly what that looks like by looking at a pretty standard function for optimization. So it's called the Himmelblau function. And the source of this function is here. Uh, but we'll see exactly what it looks like in just a sec. So this is what this function looks like. It's an interesting function for uh, black box op uh, black box optimization or continuous optimization because it has multiple local minimum, uh, which can be deceiving for the search. Uh, so we're, we're going to see how our one plus one and one plus lambda evolutionary strategies function in this space. So the objective again is minimization. We want to go towards these circles because those are minimas in this search space. So let's start with uh, a random point, as we specified before. Here I'm expanding out the, the size of our uh, initial random point a bit, but uh, it's still just a randomly generated point. Then we're going to uh, create 20 points around that original point, and we're just going to plot them. So here we have our centroid, the red point, and 20 blue points around it. We know the fitness of the centroid, and we can also calculate the fitness of all of these other points in our search space. Uh, that will uh, inform us about where the minimum is of this function. We can see that we have one of the points that we generated that is very close to that minimum, which could tell us you know, we want to move our search in that direction because its fitness is lower than the other. And that is effectively what we do in the one plus lambda uh, evolutionary strategy. Instead of simply looking at a single point and using that to replace our, our individual x, we look at lambda points. So just as we did before, we add a Gaussian noise to our existing uh, x. And uh, if the fitness of this new individual is less than the fitness of our current expert, we take that individual uh, as our new expert. We do that multiple times uh, over, uh, uh, over what we'll call generations until we reach a termination criteria. So just so that we get a little bit of vocabulary, J.B. talked about the evolutionary metaphor, and, and suddenly we're in this world of continuous optimization. But in evolutionary strategies, we're going to call that point x the parent, uh, or all of the points in uh, x the parent generation. And then we'll refer to x prime, uh, or all of the new points, as offspring. Uh, every point we can refer to as an individual. And then the uh, objective function evaluation of an individual we'll call its fitness. Each iteration of our algorithm we're going to call a generation. So the, uh, the natural selection process that we have in an evolutionary algorithm, that comes in here where we're selecting the best individual based on this objective function fitness. And otherwise, uh, the, the course of evolution plays out over different generations of creating new individuals. There's another uh, notation that is 
interesting to, to understand if you want to go further into detail on the evolutionary um, strategies literature, which is this uh, one plus uh, lambda notation. We'll either refer to evolutionary strategies by calling them uh, something comma something or something plus something. Uh, and in general, it will be mu comma lambda or mu plus lambda. That simply means the number of parents involved in creating the offspring in the first part of that uh, sentence. And then the uh, second part, the lambda, is the number of offspring. We'll use a comma to say that we do not keep the individuals, the, the parents for the new offspring, and a plus to say that we do keep the parents for the new offspring. Again, that's just sort of a nomenclature point. Uh, it's interesting if you want to understand the literature of evolutionary strategies, but it's not the most important. So here I've just taken the pseudocode of the one plus lambda algorithm and put it in a in, in Python format. So let's step through it real quick. We have our best individual that we'll be keeping track of, and we have the best individual's fitness. We're also going to keep track of all of the fitness values over the different generations, just so that we have a, a record once evolution ends. For uh, a set number of generations, so here I've decided that the termination criteria is going to be based on a static number of generations. Like I said, it could be something else. It could be reaching the maximum fitness of our objective function, or it could be uh, some other uh, termination criteria. Here we're just going to go for a static number of 100 generations. So 100 iterations of this step of creating new individuals and sampling the fitness at those new individual points. So here we have the uh, random noise. I'm creating it for all individuals at once uh, because that's faster to do in NumPy. And then going through each individual and calculating the fitness of that individual by calling the objective function. Here's the selection step to replace the individual uh, if, the, uh, uh, if the fitness of this new individual is better than the fitness of the other one. And again, a reminder that here we are minimizing, so we want smaller fitnesses. So there's our definition of the one plus lambda evolutionary strategy. That's all that it is. And this evolutionary strategy is written in a way that could scale up to neuroevolution, which we'll see later, uh, and to application to reinforcement learning problems. But as you can see, the algorithm itself is very simple and, and very easy to write. We're going to just look at it for now, still in the case of the Himmelblau function, so that we can visualize what the search looks like in the search space, because once we get to neural networks, it's going to be pretty impossible to visualize them. So here I'm just doing uh, the one plus lambda evolutionary strategy five times. And we'll talk about why I'm doing it multiple times once we see the results. So here is the average result with one standard deviation uh, of the evolution of this Himmelblau function, which can get pretty small. Uh, if we remember what the function looks like, there are zero points which are pretty close to zero, uh, to true zero here, 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 and here. So we're doing well homing in on those zero points. The reason that we have a standard deviation here uh, and something to keep in mind is that these algorithms are inherently stochastic. They start with a random point, and every mutation is random. Uh, every change that we make to our individuals is a new generation of random numbers. So the variance of these evolutionary strategies is potentially very high. Uh, and when we compare these algorithms to other algorithms, uh, for example, deep reinforcement learning algorithms, it's always useful to keep in mind multiple trials so that we're sure uh, of the, the results that we're getting, so that we're, we're confident uh, statistically of 
what the average of those results should be over multiple independent trials. Specifically in the Himmelblau function, we can maybe imagine that if we start at a point over here, as opposed to a point over here, we're going to end up in different minima at the end of the search because we're going to have generated individuals in a very different area of the search space. The same thing applies for uh, evolving policies for reinforcement learning. So that's the one plus lambda evolutionary strategy. I hope that that's uh, clear until now because it's a very simple algorithm, but it's also the base for what we're going to use uh, to make more complex algorithms, notably mu lambda evolutionary strategies and CMAES. First, let's talk about uh, using these lambda points in a little bit more of an intelligent way than we've been doing until now. So we've got these lambda points that we uh, generate around our individual x. However, we only used in the one plus lambda one of those individuals. We selected whichever one had the best fitness value, and we use that for the, for the next generation. We're losing a lot of information doing that, and specifically the information that we're losing is fitness, the information on the fitness landscape that our population is in. So instead, what we can do is estimate the gradient using that information. Here's an example of a starting point and all of the different points around it that we could have generated through a random sample. We see from those different points, the different gradient directions that they would pull our point in. All of these points over here would pull this point in this direction because we know that there's a local minimum here. Similarly, we have points over here which would pull the individual in that direction. We want to aggregate this information so that the next generation can be informed not only by the best point, which would be uh, here, but by all of the points together. So we move our uh, population in the direction of the gradient. The one way to do that is by calculating the gradient uh, directly using all of the points in the population as an estimate for the gradient. So let's look at, uh, at doing that. First thing that we're going to do is normalize the fitness so that it's relative to our population as opposed to the absolute fitness in the entire search space. That's going to guarantee that we have a movement that's more fluid over the entire search space uh, that doesn't depend on what our sampling was, but rather the relative values of the gradient between the individuals. Next, we're going to define the uh, vector of the direction that we want to go, uh, which is just this uh, uh, normal distribution sampling that we've uh, created before. Then we take those directional points and we multiply them by the relative gradient that we, or the relative fitness that we calculated earlier. So this normalized fitness value which is going to tell us for all of our points that we've sampled, how much should we move in the direction of all of these different points? That turns out to be the equivalent to the dot product and we're going to use that as our gradient approximation. Uh, just a, a quick change to make it negative since we want to do minimization. So here is all of that in Python. Uh, here's the normalization step. Here is the uh, vector of our directions. And here finally is the uh, gradient estimation. So when we plot that, it, uh, we have again, all of our arrows uh, of the different gradient directions uh, that we used in, uh, that we created in N. Uh, their scale is now normalized in A, and the end result is G, the small arrow on our black centroid point here. So we can tell the 
aggregate information of the population, which is our X value, where we want to go uh, to minimize this gradient based on all of the points that we've used in this population, the, the estimate of the gradient. And we can see that it's moving towards this local minima because we had more information uh, in our population on that minima than other ones. So we know that the gradient is negative in that direction. We want to move our um, we want to move our, our population centroid in that direction. One question is how much should we move in that direction? It's an estimate of the gradient. And so uh, we might not want to move directly in that uh, direction. So we apply a learning rate just as we do in stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and we will call it alpha, just like is done in SGD. So let's put all of that together um, and call it an evolutionary strategy. Uh, in the nomenclature of evolutionary strategies, it's going to be a mu lambda evolutionary strategies, evolutionary strategy where mu in this case is equal to lambda. So you could also say lambda lambda. Um, we're going to use the entire population to inform our next step, but we're not going to keep any individuals from the previous population. We're going to throw out all individuals and just keep the aggregate information, which is their sum for the next generation. So specifically what that looks like is uh, we initialize some X randomly, and then we add uh, we create a vector n. Uh, we add n to x, so that's our, our random noise. Uh, and then once we've gotten all of the fitness values for uh, all individuals in our population, we do this fitness normalizing step a. And then we apply uh, the new gradient information, so a uh, dotted with n. 2x uh, moving by a specific amount alpha. So I saw a raised hand, uh, but no questions. Make sure to write your questions in the, uh, in the Q and A so that we can respond to them. Uh, there we go. So this is the mu lambda uh, evolutionary strategy that we defined before. It is not the only mu lambda evolutionary strategy. Uh, it's just in the nomenclature of how we call evolutionary strategies, it is a mu lambda evolutionary strategy. And we'll see another mu lambda evolutionary strategy next. Uh, but uh, the one that we defined here can be written in Python like this. It's very similar to before. We keep a track of the best individuals and a fitness over the entire evolution so that we can uh, see how evolution did at the end. Then we have our random noise. Uh, finally, we go through all of the individuals, add that noise to our previous uh, centroid, and calculate the fitness. That's the evaluation step of our evolutionary strategy. Then we update the state of our evolutionary strategy, the centroid of our population, which we'll use as the parent individual for the next generation. So we calculate uh, the mean and, and standard deviation. Uh, we make sure that our standard deviation isn't zero, so we're not dividing by bad things. Uh, and then after we have our normalized fitness values, we apply it to x using a specific learning rate. So a little bit more complex than the one that we were looking at before, the one plus lambda, but still an algorithm that you know you can write in, uh, in not very much time, uh, and which is already very good at solving reinforcement learning problems, which we'll see next. So again, I'm going to apply it multiple times to this Himmelblau function so that we have an idea of its uh, average performance. And we can see that it also does well at uh, optimizing the Himmelblau function. It doesn't do quite as well as the one plus lambda, uh, but 
the Himmelblau is, is an example function uh, and relatively simple searches actually do pretty well on the Himmelblau function. So uh, next we're going to apply it to reinforcement learning problems and see that it does pretty well in those cases. So in the- May I interrupt you for a second? Um, yeah. uh, just two things, one participant request, if you could just remove the block of cameras from Zoom from the side of your screen, you know, by just minimizing it or there's a little depth. Sorry, I always forget that that's visible. Yep, it's gone. Um, and th there are some questions. So f first of all, uh, Jean-Baptiste and Olivier and, Lud and TAs have been answering quite a bunch of questions already. So for people who actually have questions, please also check whether they have been answered already in the Q&A. Maybe I can pass some of the current ones to you if you want to answer them for everybody, um, unless you're short on time and then we can keep on answering them text-based. So I see the first one in the uh, Q&A, which is in the mu uh, lambda pseudocode, what is the dimension of x? Uh, for the Himmelblau function, x is simply uh, two, uh, a vector of, of size two. So uh, we're only in a two-dimensional version. We see the generation of x here. It's just a vector of size two. Uh, the question of why gradient-based approaches would be better than just choosing the best. Um, so if we have the best individual in a space um, like this, uh, we are necessarily going to go towards this local minima uh, if we always just take the best. However, we have some other individuals that we've sampled in this space that tell us about other local minima that there are in this search space. Uh, this gradient estimate tells us about the local minima that's here. Uh, and these gradient estimates tell us about the minima that are on this side of the search space. Using a gradient-based approach is a way to uh, accumulate all of that information together for our next population update, rather than uh, just using a single point in our gradient estimate and then discarding the rest. Thanks, Dennis. There are no more questions. Thanks a lot for taking the time to answer those. Yeah, great. So, uh, but keep uh, asking questions if, if you have other questions. Uh, let's now see this applied to neuroevolution. Uh, so to the evolution of neural network parameters, uh, which we can use as policies in reinforcement learning tasks. Uh, in general, evolutionary strategies are intended for and work well for continuous optimization problems. And since uh, most neural networks have continuous parameters, weights, and biases, uh, the use of evolutionary strategies is fairly logical for uh, neural network parameter optimization. Benefit of torch, which is automatic differentiation, uh, because we're not actually going to be doing backprop or anything like that. Here's the definition of the neural network that I'm going to use. Uh, the first part of it would might look pretty standard. Uh, we have a two hidden uh, layer neural network uh, where we have a certain input size based on our environment and then a certain number of actions. So here we're going to be looking at discrete action cases. Then we have the forward pass where I'm going to be applying ReLU activation functions uh, to our neural network uh, outputs. Uh, and then finally, nothing on the, the final layer. These two functions are going to enable us to do evolution uh, easily. So first of all, I want to be able to get the parameters, uh, the full list of, of parameters of any neural network. We're going to consider the, the parameters of the neural network 
the genes in our evolutionary algorithm. It is the values that we're optimizing all as a single thing. Uh, the neural network, uh, the, the evolutionary strategy is not inherently aware of the structure of the neural network. It considers all of the genes as just different uh, independent variables. Then uh, we have a second uh, function, which is going to allow us to use a gene uh, string as parameters for the neural network. So we're going to feed uh, all of our genes into the neural network to set the parameters, the, the different weights and biases of our neural network. Uh, there are some commands in here that are going to let us visualize uh, gym environments. If you're using Colab, you'll need to install those. So this evaluation function uh, shows how we can use evolutionary strategies for reinforcement learning tasks. Uh, the most familiar parts of this, I hope at, at, at this point in the, uh, uh, in the RLVS is the gym step. Uh, I assume that you all have seen this before at this point, uh, where we're going to take an action using the output of our neural network and then call uh, mv.step action, getting the new state, the new reward, uh, and whether or not the environment has finished. Uh, we're going to keep track of the total reward over the entire episode and add at each step the reward. Another thing to note is that we're only going until this done condition turns up true. So we're going to evaluate our individual over in a single episode. Uh, this is sometimes called episode rollout. Uh, and what we're going to look at in terms of the objective function that we want to maximize or minimize uh, is the total reward over a single episode. So that's one of the big differences between reinforcement learning algorithms and evolutionary policy search. We're looking at the entire reward uh, given over a single episode, sometimes over multiple episodes, uh, but the algorithm is rather flexible to what do we consider the objective function uh, in our uh, evaluation? So let's make a example network and try it out on the lunar lander problem. Uh, the objective of this problem is to land this spaceship uh, in, a, in a good way on the moon. As we can see, it doesn't really work out. So these are just uh, random policies. Every time we create one of these neural networks, we are creating a new random individual. And these will be the starting point for our uh, evolutionary search. But we can also get an idea of what the evaluation is going to look like as we evaluate different random policies on this problem. Uh, so, we're going to go through, modify the genome, and uh, set the parameters of our neural network to this new genome to evaluate it. So the fitness of our genome X is going to be the evaluation of an ANN whose parameters are X, which we can see here. So I'll just define a new function fitness. That could have been defined already in the evaluate function, but just uh, separate it out for a little bit of logic. We're going to call this a direct encoding because the genes of our individuals are directly the weights and biases of our neural network. Uh, what uh, Jean-Baptiste is going to present soon is indirect encodings where we also evolve the uh, architecture of the neural network uh, the, the number of nodes, the links between the nodes. Here, we are using a static network and we are evolving directly the weights and biases of that network. So let's see how many parameters this network has. It has 1,476. It's a relatively small network because our 
size uh, that we selected is 32, 32 for those hidden layers. So we could get much larger than this. And this is one of the scaling problems with evolutionary strategies that uh, people were unsure of for their application to reinforcement learning tasks, especially when we get into large spaces like the, uh, the Atari domain. Let's see how a random individual X does. Again, uh, the objective here is to land gently uh, on the surface, so we're not doing very well. Uh, but now that we have a function, an objective function that we can minimize, uh, we can use our mu lambda evolutionary algorithm to optimize towards that. So let's run it and we see immediately that uh, we get some improvement in the first generation. Again, uh, because of the way that we wrote the mu lambda algorithm, we are minimizing. We could have chosen to maximize, uh, but in this case, we're going to minimize. And uh, what we're seeing here is the negative of the sum reward. And here's our uh, final individual after 30 generations. So it does a little bit better. Uh, it lands a little bit more gently and it doesn't uh, fall on its head. So we're doing better, but it's still a negative score in an environment where the maximum score is closer to 200, uh, 300. So we can definitely improve on this and we'll see how right now. So uh, the difference here to, to respond to the question, how is our objective different than in reinforcement learning? Uh, we're optimizing the total reward over one episode. That's exactly right. We're not going to look at what is the maximal reward that we might get from a certain state. Uh, what is the total uh, value of being in a certain state or taking a certain action? We're not going to try to figure that out for any state or any specific transition in this problem. Rather, what we're looking at is the aggregate fitness over the entire episode as an objective function that we're trying to maximize. So that's seen here, uh, total reward, return total reward. Uh, the total reward is all of the information that we're basing this off of, whether that reward came at the very end of the episode, in the middle of the episode, was caused by taking a specific action, the algorithm is unaware of those sort of, uh, of that sort of information. It's basing the decision entirely off of what is the total sum reward at the end of the episode, which is a fairly big difference from, uh, from reinforcement learning. So uh, we're going to quickly cover a different mu lambda evolutionary strategy, which has been used in reinforcement learning uh, tasks, specifically on the Atari domain, uh, and which brings us closer to CMAES. We can make two observations about the mu lambda evolutionary strategy that we had until now, which is, first of all, not all lambda points could be useful in the centroid update. As we discussed earlier, it's probably better than to use uh, more than one. Uh, we don't want to throw out all the information, but maybe there are some points that are actually not uh, beneficial for the centroid update. The second one is uh, that the exact gradient information might be less useful than the relative rank of individual fitness. And we'll talk about that uh, with a visualization. So instead of using all of the lambda points, let's define mu to be smaller than lambda and specifically we're going to use one half lambda. Then we're going to create a vector of weights that decreases exponentially from the first to the last and which sums to one. That's the, the summing to one property is just going to let us easily use these weights to normalize our gradient updates. Uh, but we want them to decrease exponentially from uh, first to last so that the first, the, the most uh, uh, fit individual in our population informs the gradient update a lot more than our second fit, the most fit and third most fit individual. So this is the, 
the formula that's most often used for the generation of weights. And it's used in this evolutionary strategy called canonical ES and also in CMA ES. Just like we did in the previous mu lambda evolutionary strategy, we're going to uh, create a random starting point and then add Gaussian noise to that starting point. So we can see those fitness values here and what their absolute values are. But instead of using the absolute values, we're going to use the weighted, uh, uh, the weighted and normalized version of a subset of those values. So instead, we have uh, the gradient directions coming from the weighted values here. To see what that looks like, we have this plot. In, in semi-transparent are the points that we generated, which would have been used for the entire gradient update. But what we have in a darker color are the gradient updates based on this weighted information. And what we can directly see is that the most fit individual has a, a large influence on the gradient update. Uh, it's going to push us heavily towards this uh, minima and not towards this one, even though uh, we did have some individuals in the population going towards that gradient. Those individuals have a much smaller weight because of the uh, the exponentially decreasing weights for the different ranks. And then finally, we're not using some of the in other individuals which might point us towards parts of the search space that are different local minima, are further away, or are even deceptive. So we're only using a subset of the information to inform our movement in the gradient space, uh, which could make the search more reliable. So the first point, uh, could be uh, pretty evident. We get more reliable results by not using the entire sample, but by using the best parts of the, the new population. The second point is a little bit harder to understand. Uh, why do we want to use rank instead of weights? And the reason is that uh, we want invariance to a certain type of transformation to this search space. Specifically, any transformation which preserves the rank of those individuals is not going to change our update, which means that the search space could be very badly formed uh, and we would still be able to move well using this rank update where a gradient uh, based update, if we're using the, directly the fitness values might be deceptive. If you'd like more information on that, there's a, an article specifically about it for CMAES called Impacts of Invariance in Search when CMAES and PSO face ill-conditioned and non-separable problems. If we combine these two changes to the previous uh, mu lambda evolutionary strategy that we had, we're going to get uh, to an evolutionary strategy that's referred to as canonical evolutionary strategy. Uh, and is described here. It was uh, written in 2018, but it also uh, does a good job citing and, and recognizing that most of these improvements to evolutionary strategies have existed since the early 2000s. It was mostly an application to reinforcement learning tasks uh, and a study uh, of how evolutionary strategies can scale to large neural networks. So we have the weight ranks, uh, which are defined beforehand. That's that list of exponentially decreasing weights. Then we have the noise sampling step, adding uh, our weight to, adding the, the noise to uh, uh, our current uh, centroid. Then uh, sorting the individuals to use this weight uh, rank update, and finally, doing the update based on the, the weight ranks to our population centroid. There's also a sigma update step, which we'll talk about for CMAES, but which isn't really used here in the canonical evolutionary strategy. What they showed in their article is that uh, this canonical evolutionary strategy, which is relatively simple, easy to implement, uh, is 
very performant compared to state of the art results. Uh, so the OpenAI evolutionary strategy article compared to DQN, uh, compared to other uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning algorithms, and the canonical evolutionary strategy is doing just as well or even better than those results on a number of different benchmark tasks, especially as uh, evolution goes further in time. One thing to note here is the, the small uh, total uh, wall time that these experiments took. So they only took one hour to achieve uh, uh, some considerably good results, especially, for example, 21 in Pong within an hour. So how, how did they do that? Uh, well, one of the advantages of evolutionary strategies and evolutionary algorithms in general is that they're embarrassingly parallel. The way that you parallelize them is simply by separating the evaluations onto as many threads as possible. Uh, so we have these lambda different evaluations that we're going to do every time. If we do those on lambda different threads, then we can do them completely in parallel. And there's nothing in the algorithm that requires us to do them sequentially. So that's a big benefit in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, parallelization. I'm going to go really quickly through, uh, uh, through the last part of this, because we have to get back to uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste's part. So uh, we have the basic components now uh, for CMA, yes. Uh, we have uh, the uh, mu lambda evolutionary strategy with rank update. Uh, and we just have a few small changes that we'll make to bring us to CMAS, the, the state of the art of evolutionary strategies. Specifically, the, thing that we're, the things that we're going to change are that we're going to have a history inside the evolutionary strategy longer than a single generation uh, so that we can accumulate information over the search. We're also going to transform this normal distribution uh, using a covariance matrix so that we're not constrained to always looking around uh, in a, a Gaussian circle around our, our current individual. It's going to transform based on previous updates in the search. And then finally, we have a step size update. Uh, so we're going to change sigma as we uh, go through the search. Uh, this is a, a summary of, of sort of the, the major contributions of CMAES. So again, we have this multivariate normal distribution, uh, which we're going to change based on the covariance matrix. Uh, we rank solutions according to their fitness instead of, uh, instead of using their fitness directly, which makes the search invariant to order preserving transformations. Uh, we update the mean and the covariance matrix uh, at every step. And we update the step size so that our algorithm can move in different uh, steps uh, over the search, sometimes taking large leaps, sometimes moving in small uh, little steps. So in this part, we're going to use a package called PyCMA, which is developed and maintained by the author of CMAES and does a few more things than what we've described here. Uh, there's a good summary and, and review of everything that PyCMA has in terms of bells and whistles uh, in this article here. So we're going to, again, apply this to the lunar lander problem. Uh, and what we're going to start with is a point at 0 uh, with a standard deviation of 1. And we're simply going to run for 20 generations. In PyCMA, we use an ask tell uh, syntax. So we're going to ask for the population at each generation and then tell it what the fitness values are. And this is the line that could be very easily parallelized. Here, I'm doing it sequentially. Uh, but if I had lambda threads running, I could easily gather the fitness values for lambda threads at the same time. And we have finally the result of CMAS. We see that now, finally, our lunar lander does land very gracefully, 
CMAES was able to find a very good policy by minimizing the negative value, so maximizing the total fitness uh, of the entire episode over 30 generations. One final note on evolutionary strategies is that CMAES is an excellent uh, uh, evolutionary strategy. It works very well on a number of benchmark uh, problems uh, and has been applied to other ones. However, for the question of neuroevolution and uh, uh, evolutionary reinforcement learning, it's an open question on how to apply it because of the large size of the covariance matrix, uh, which it uses to transform that normal distribution uh, that we use to sample every step. The size of that is O of n squared. Uh, and so in this case, it's 1,500 by 1,500 uh, for all of the parameters of our neural network. So if we can imagine as we scale the neural network up to uh, convolutional nets, used in policies for uh, Atari, it's going to get very complicated very fast. I'm going to quickly go through uh, multi-objective optimization. Uh, I am not going to have time to explain how to get the gradient approximation again, uh, but I welcome you to uh, look at uh, the notebook and to ask questions in matrix. So we've talked about evolutionary strategies, which are good at optimizing a single objective. Uh, we always had one objective function, which was going to be the sum total of our reward. Another benefit of evolutionary algorithms is that they can optimize more than one objective simultaneously. So an example of this is if we're planning a car trip uh, and we want to minimize the total distance traveled, but also the tolls that we pay on different toll roads on our trip through France. There are a number of multi-objective -evolu uh, multi evolutionary algorithms that have a rich history starting all the way back in the 1990s uh, and that are continuing to improve today. We'll talk about one of the current uh, research directions in multi-objective evolutionary algorithms, but it's a, an active and uh, uh, long existing field. A, Brief overview of, of the problem of multi-objective uh, optimization can be summarized used in Pareto front optimization. So if we have individuals in a search space that has two objectives, uh, we can see that some individuals are going to be better at both objectives than other individuals. When that is the case, uh, and here we are maximizing these two objectives, we're going to say that one individual is Pareto dominant over another individual. So S1 is dominant over S2, S3 is dominant over S4 because it is better than both uh, of the solutions in these spaces. We're going to uh, call the other solutions non-dominated, uh, the ones that are not as good uh, uh, in one or multiple of the objectives. The Pareto front is the set of Pareto optimal solutions. Uh, it is the non-dominated set of the entire set of solutions. So it is all of the individuals in this case for an evolutionary algorithm that are non-dominated by any other individual. And those individuals are what we're going to be looking for and selecting for, specifically in the algorithm NSGA2. Uh, so NSGA2 uh, is almost 20 years old now, uh, and it's a rather simple algorithm. It's a genetic algorithm. So one of the main differences uh, from what we've seen until now is that we consider that our population size is much larger maybe on the order of hundreds of individuals as opposed to singular ones. Uh, the selection phase uh, that we're going to do uh, that is specific to multi-objective optimization comes in this step three. Uh, and what we're going to do is bring in different sets of non-dominated individuals. So we'll see that now. 
If we look at all of the individuals in the population, we can identify multiple non-dominated sets. There is, of course, the Pareto front, the non-dominated set over the entire population. However, if we remove those individuals, then we also have another Pareto front behind them. Uh, similarly, if we remove them, we have the third Pareto front behind them. So these waves of non-dominated sets are what we're going to use in our selection algorithm. Specifically, we go through and take each front at a time and add it to the next population. That process is called the fast non-dominated sort. And I'm sorry, but I have to go through it fast. The second part of NSGA2 that is very uh, necessary for the algorithm to function is that once we've filled up the next generation by taking in the different waves of non-dominated individuals, we're going to have still a big chunk of the population left possibly. How do we select individuals there? Well, the idea in, in NSGA2 is to take individuals that are as far away from each other as possible. We want to have basically a maximum spread across the Pareto front as possible. And that's what you do in NSGA2 with the crowding distance assignment, where we draw cuboids around every individual and we look to maximize the area of those cuboids, taking the individuals that have the most distance between them and other ones. What that's going to give us is individuals that are at different points along the Pareto front. If we consider that we have many, many objectives, that'll give us individuals that are good at some objectives, but not necessarily good at others. So again, the NSGA2 uh, algorithm mostly functions as a standard genetic algorithm, uh, but we do this non-dominated sorting to take in the waves of the Pareto front into our next gener uh, generation. And then once we have our next generation almost filled up, we're going to take all of the rest by doing a non-dominated sorting, uh, by doing a crowding distance sorting, getting a full covering of the Pareto front. Uh, a brief parenthesis to say that one of the current directions in multi-objective optimization is called many objective optimization, where we consider the idea uh, that the more objectives that we have, uh, the smaller a dominating region actually gets. And so searching for non-dominating sets becomes harder and harder. And there are new methods that are uh, intended to solve this problem by looking at coverage of the Pareto front rather than non-dominated sets. But uh, let's talk more about how these are used in the reinforcement learning context. Uh, so often uh, we want to maximize the total reward, just as we were doing with our evolutionary strategies. But we might want to also maximize a certain behavior uh, or minimize energy cost. Uh, and these are the different objectives that we can add as new objectives to our evolutionary algorithm. And a benefit of the evolutionary algorithm is that we can have multiple different solutions along the Pareto front simultaneously, giving us different policies that have uh, different advantages. So here's a recent article that demonstrates that well, where we have uh, uh, the cheetah robot, which is being optimized to have different energy saving uh, and different forward speed. So the two objectives are to go fast as forward, uh, as, uh, as fast as possible forward, but also to be energy efficient. We see other examples of uh, objectives later on in their work. And I want to highlight them before uh, passing the word, uh, the presentation back to JB, because what we can see here is that we optimize as an objective for different types of behavior. Uh, specifically, we're asking the hoppers to develop different jumping heights. Uh, beyond what the original objective is, which is just moving forward as much as possible. Uh, so here we also have a, another efficiency one, uh, but multi-objective optimization can be a way to get individuals that have different types of behavior. And as JB will talk about, 
having a diversity of behavior in your search can be a good way to uh, promote better uh, solutions in general towards, uh, towards your fitness objective of maximizing reward. So uh, I'd like to pass it back to JB. I, I think uh, it's a little bit late. If there is any time, Dennis, the two last questions have been asked are actually really interesting. Uh, yeah. So maybe actually JB started answering them. <laughs> jibe has been really efficient at answering questions on the Q&A. Uh, well, I'll let you decide whether you want to take them or not now. Just Great, mentioned. although I think Jibe is better positioned than me to answer the how do you measure the distance between individuals, uh, between neural networks. Yes, uh, I will answer with just uh, the next slide for me, so that's perfect. Uh, yep. So let's keep this for uh, just a bit later. <laughs> So we need to the next topic. Thank you uh, very much, Dennis, for this uh, very nice overview. Very sorry that we don't have much time. I think we should, could have spent much more time on multi-objective evolutionary algorithms because it's a very interesting idea that might be a bit counterintuitive uh, at first, but that uh, actually is very refreshing to see that we don't need to put all the objectives with a big weighted sum. We can do differently, and that has many, many interesting features. Uh, I will share my screen again. So do you see the screen? Is everything fine? Dennis, can you open up? Yep. OK, so uh, I will do a short overview of NEAT and HyperNEAT, which are ways to evolve not only the weights, but also the topology. Uh, again, because we are very constrained in time, uh, I will go over this rather quickly because I want to spend as much time as possible on the last part, which I find um, more exciting, I would say, uh, more novel. Uh, but still, I think it's important to, to at, least, at least realize all the work that has been done uh, about all of this during the years. So uh, if you want to evolve both the structure and the weights of a neural network, uh, it's quite simple, actually, because uh, evolution is a very um, flexible framework. So we can just uh, encode the graph as a genotype. So you can use like uh, any representation for a graph that you want. You can use a weight matrix. You can use a list of whatever. So the actual question then is, what is a mutation operator? So typically, we design mutation operators that would add connections between two random nodes, uh, another mutation operator that would remove an existing connection, another one that would add a new one. Usually, it's done on an existing connection, so we don't, uh, it has like no influence to add a new neuron. It does not break as a functionality. And of course, something to change the weight, like some Gaussian perturbation. Once you have all these mutations with uh, probabilities to apply all of them, uh, you can just use any evolutionary algorithm. So not evolutionary strategies, but the same loop of I generate new solution, I select the best, I rank them, uh, I add mutations, and then uh, I get, uh, uh, so I add mutation, I evaluate the best, and then we loop and so on, we get best, better and better solutions. Uh, if you do this, it's not easy to define crossovers, so we can mix solutions, so usually it's not used. So it's basically this, and that's what we call a direct encoding. Um, it does not work very well usually because when you're doing all these things, changing the structure and the weights at the same time, it becomes a very, very non-smooth problem. You add a connection and then it destroys everything. Uh, it's like uh, you had a connection and your neural network is doing something very different. So of course it's not competitive and it's excluded for the next generation. Uh, are the slide moving now? Should be slide three. Uh, Denise, can you confirm? Oh, no, uh, the, the slides are not moving. Uh, I don't know what's wrong now. Let's just try again. So what now? Uh, no, sorry, we're still just saying the static slide. It was working just uh, 10 minutes ago. We try to share the screen.
Do you see now? Uh, the the keynote uh, software. Okay, and now does it move? Yep. No, no it moves. Okay. Uh, okay, I will not see your questions anymore. Uh, okay, let's do it like this. So, so I was describing uh, all of this. And so one of the main question is, uh, how do we ensure that when we add a new connection or we remove a, a new neuron or something like this, we don't just destroy everything and have something uh, like uh, the, in, the individual has a very bad fitness, so it's excluded. And then you never, never explore new structures. So that was the challenge of NEAT. Uh, which has been a very influential evolutionary algorithm, a very influential framework for doing new evolution. Uh, the paper is uh, almost 20 years old, so we're talking about old stuff here. So I think it's interesting, but it's not like state of the art, and I will not have like um, benchmarks with uh, modern algorithms because it was done much, much before. Uh, and I don't think we have uh, any very recent benchmark of need versus uh, other approaches right now. So uh, NEAT has two ideas. Uh, one is to grow incrementally. So we start with a population of neural networks and they all have the exact same uh, topology. Uh, this is important because uh, then we can compare them easy, more easy, uh, in a more easy way uh, with another trick that is included in NEAT, which is to use what they call innovate, innovation numbers. So each time we add a new connection, uh, then we give it a unique ID. So there is a global counter for every new connection. So the genome in it looks like this. Uh, we have a list of uh, nodes, which has a list of, um, of uh, um, neurons, and list of genes, which says what is the input node, what is the output node, what is weight, there is an enable or disable thing, uh, which is just to disable a gene if needed. That's not really important. And when there is this innovation number, which is a global number again. Uh, it's like a unique ID for this specific connection. And since all the neural networks start from this exact same topology, uh, these innovation numbers will make them comparable. Uh, so that's what we do with here. So we can compare, we can compare two neural networks uh, by aligning them. So that's what you see on the picture on the right. We have two parents uh, that have different topology. And it's actually very hard to know how we, what, how we differ because we want to compute uh, the, essentially a distance between graphs. And in algorithmics, that's very quickly a big problem. Uh, in, depending on how you formalize it, it's something like an, usually it's NPR. Uh, of course, then you need to take into account the weights. So just knowing how these two neural networks will match to either mix them or compare them for some other purpose uh, is very hard. But if you have innovation numbers, you can align the genes, which is uh, what we see uh, on the second, second row. We have parent one and parent two. They have genes that are in common because they all started from the same exact same topology. They all started with the exact same genes. So they necessarily have some genes in common. They have some genes that are disjoint because maybe one, the individual on the left added a connection that the Individuals on the right, uh, they do not share like um, uh, any story, so they, they may have diverged. So they have some disjoint uh, genes, uh, some excess genes, because maybe the individual on the right added a new connection. So there are new, more connections. Uh, so we align all of this and we count uh, the number of joints, number of disjoint joints, and then we can use this for crossover. So the rule in need is that we, for, when we cross these two networks, uh, these joint genes, uh, INX genes are inherited from the most fit parent, and all the genes in common are inherited, and then the weights are usually assigned randomly. We can have several bio. So this is to cross things, but crossing things during this crossover things uh, is not that significant. What is much more significant is that once you can compare neural networks, you can define a distance between them, and then you can do what uh, NEED calls uh, innovation protection, which means that we, when we have a new topology, it does not really compete with the old ones. It's like in its own niche. It's, it's competing only with things that are very close to it. 
So to do this uh, in concrete terms, we do the same alignment and we compute uh, what we have on the left, which is a simple weighted sum in which we have a, the distance is the number of X genes plus the number of these joint genes plus the weight differences for the genes that are the same. And then we have weights of so C1, C2, and C3 to weight these things. So with this, we can say this neural network is the same as this one, it's very different or very close to the other one. So given a population, uh, we can compute distances. And then I need to use this something called fitness sharing, which is an old thing from genetic algorithms to define niches. So the general idea of fitness sharing is that we divide the fitness functions, the reward, uh, by the number of individuals that are in the same niche. So if you have a niche which is very good, so all the individuals have very good fitness, but you have many of them, uh, then they have to split this fitness point all among them. So that makes them uh, less fit. So less interesting to be selected as the next generation. So that self-regulates the size of a niche uh, depending on the fitness. So the way it's done is that we replace the fitness by the fitness dividing by the number of individuals that have uh, that are close to closer than some threshold, uh, which is a parameter, an hyperparameter, which is that has to be defined. So with this, uh, NEAT uh, can uh, evolve the structure of neural networks. So at that time, people were testing a lot with uh, inverse pendulums, double inverse pendulums, and tons of things like this. And it was much more effective than any other neural evolution approach at the time. I don't think it's necessarily competitive right now, but uh, we could be surprised. It's quite competitive on some sp on small neural networks with uh, just a few inputs uh, for control task. Uh, for this, it's usually one of the top uh, algorithms. Uh, it does not scale up very well to very big um, input space like uh, images, of course, because then you have to uh, evolve every connection one by one and so on, and might not be the best for this. Uh, but it's quite competitive for small things. Uh, and, and that includes all the Mujoko tasks, like all of this uh, walking and things like this, which actually uh, have a quite small input space and output space. Uh, but what's important to see here is that uh, what really matters for NEAT is the speciation. So it's the protection of the novel architectures. Uh, we can actually enforce this differently. So instead of speciation, we proposed something a long time ago uh, called behavioral diversity. So instead of defining a distance between neural networks, which as we said before, is quite complicated and have need solves it with um, innovation numbers, but it's not really what matters. What matters is that the behaviors are different. So for instance, on the bottom right, you see uh, an example in which you have, you can have two genotypes that are exactly, uh, that are almost the same, but the robot behaves differently, like it turns on left or right, it takes a different corridor. But at the same time, you can have many, many neural networks that have exactly the same behavior, like turn, the robot turns on itself, it spins or something like this. But at the same time, uh, they all behave the same, like, uh, so they're not really exploring. So what matters at the end is the exploration in behavior space. So if we can define a distance in behavior space, so for instance, we can look at uh, uh, the distance uh, in, uh, between two trajectories. We simulate a robot, we get a trajectory in space, like in this uh, small robot on the right, uh, we have this um, uh, neural network that drives a small robot to take these balls, and what is the actual path that is taken by the robot? And um, we can define a distance by this, or we can use a sensory stream, like at every time step, what are the sensors? We get huge vectors, and then we just compute the distance between them. So if we can compute this, then we can use a multi-objective evolutionary algorithms, like what we described before, like in SGA2, to maximize two objectives. One is the fitness, so the reward, and the other one is the diversity with regard to the population. That's just to keep sure that in the population, all the individuals are doing things differently. And that works very well. So in that example here, we're evolving a neural network uh, that has to solve a sequential task. So it has to take balls, then take balls, uh, put them in the blue basket. Uh, and it can also push the uh, switch on the bottom left. And then it opens the door and gives access to new balls. But the reward here is very sparse. The reward here is only when the number of balls that we put at the end. But because we're exploring the behavior space, uh, then uh, we solve very nicely uh, this, um, this task. And actually the neural networks are quite simple, just a few hidden neurons. So 
that looks like a complex sequential task, but you don't need a deep neural network to actually solve it. You mostly need to explore well in the behavior space. So the key for evolving topologies, the, the, the conclusion for this, for NEAT and for this behavioral diversity approach is uh, diversity. It needs to be, uh, we need to protect uh, innovation in the topology. And I think the behavioral approach is working very well. So the next step is, okay, but as I say, NEAT is very good for small neural networks, but they, are, they do not scale up to, to big ones. And the reason is that uh, it's involving every connection independently. That's not how a brain works. Uh, if you think of like a brain of uh, like a human's work, it's like more like you have uh, these big patterns uh, of repeating the same structure and again and again, one million times. And when you process all the pixels with the same structure, and this is uh, working, uh, I mean, this allows you to scale. We don't have every connection uh, in, in the genome. Uh, so this is a mix of uh, the ability to encode this pattern and developmental process that embeds this in the real substrate. Like if you have a worm and then you have the neurons, they will grow and they will go according also to the shape uh, of the body. And that's what at the end gives this kind of patterns. So what we want ultimately is to find the same pattern as what we have in nature. Uh, so in nature, you have like a symmetry, like left-right symmetry. My uh, face is symmetric. Uh, that means that the same gene, mostly the same genes are used to encode my left eye and my right eye. Uh, we also have an imperfect symmetry like the hands. All my fingers are quite similar and they share many, many genes, but they are not exactly the same. And then we have repetition, like the same cell repeated again and again. And if you think in terms of neural networks, uh, look at uh, the special structure of uh, convolutional neural network, it have a very specific way of organizing the weights and sharing them. So that's what we'd like to discover. And so Ken Stanley had this uh, very nice idea called uh, compositional pattern producing networks, in which the idea is that we will encode this with a small neural network with different activation functions. So let's take, uh, for, for now, let's think about patterns in 2D space because it's easier to, to show. So we take an image, like a grayscale image, and we want to know uh, the grayscale value for every pixel. And we want to see patterns. Then we'd see how we generalize this to neural networks. So we want to see these pixels. Uh, and the idea is that we design a small neural network that takes x, y as an input, so the coordinate of the pixel, and the output is uh, the grayscale value. And if you use activation functions that are a bit complicated, like if you use sine wave, then you will easily have repeating pattern. If you use a Gaussian or some uh, symmetric activation function, then uh, minus x equals plus x because it's a symmetric function and you get symmetry. But if you shift with a bias, you can have imperfect symmetry. So by like composing all these functions together in a small neural network, you very easily have all these nice patterns. So that's what uh, we see here. Uh, we see examples of images that are generated with these small uh, compositional pattern neural networks uh, with symmetry, imperfect symmetry, repetition with variation. And we mostly see all the patterns that we see in nature. It's very abstract, of course, it's not the same as uh, development in nature, but it actually captures the essence of all of this. So we can uh, generate 2D shapes, 3D shapes with these two. So in that time, we have voxels, we query the voxels, and then we get uh, the material. So it's like one if there is material, zero if not material. On the left, you see examples in which we I uh, can query and then 3D print objects. And on the right, this is like what they call soft robots. Uh, so it's, they are uh, simulated like a form-like robots. Uh, and so the white is contracting uh, to the given frequency, the green in another frequency, the blue is bones. And then we can see that evolution can find quite nice uh, uh, creatures, let's say. Uh, but also you see patterns like uh, symmetries and repetition, even at that scale, which are very useful because that's what we want uh, when we evolve something. And what's so nice here is that the same CPPN, so the same neural network can be queried at a higher resolution. So here you see it with a 10 by 10 uh, by 10 voxel uh, volume, but you can just use the same neural network and make it uh, 10 times bigger, and then you get the same, exactly as same as like, like growing, for instance. 
because you're using the same uh, development um, program. Probably. The development program is a small neural network that we query uh, for every voxel. So can we do this to have patterns in neural networks? And the answer is yes, if uh, we embed neural networks in what we call a substrate. So let's take a 2D space, we put neurons in this. So like you take a sheet of paper, you draw some hours, and this is where your neurons are. So every neuron has X, Y coordinate. And then instead of making a CPPN with only two inputs, X, Y, we take a CPPN with four inputs. So X, Y for the first neuron and X, Y for a second neuron. So we have four inputs, the coordinate from the input neuron and the coordinate uh, to the output neuron. And we query the CPPN to get the weight uh, between these two neurons. Uh, so, and if it's below threshold, we can say it's zero. We can do a few things to try to uh, prune the connections or to have another output that tells if there is a connection or not. So, with this, we have like uh, four dimensional patterns of neural connectivity. So, what you see on the right, few examples of this, we can evolve uh, patterns like uh, left right symmetry, repetition. So, in theory, we could like find correlational neural networks, so find the convolutions. Uh, by using this kind of technique that will capture the formula of the pattern. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think people have been trying to do this. And so far, I think evolution is not working well enough to find these patterns in uh, like the ones that work very well in machine learning for now. But I think the idea is very inspiring and allows us to evolve like very large uh, neural network structures, like thousands, millions of neurons uh, quite easily. And then we can also learn the pattern on uh, some small substrate, like, like uh, 100 neurons, and then scale up to 1,000 neurons uh, by just querying the CPPN. And usually you get a very interesting results too. So here's a small example uh, to learn the gate. So the substrate here is made, uh, on, is shown on the left. Uh, you have a four by three grid of neurons with different inputs, like the sine, cosine for giving some uh, rhythmic patterns. And, and then uh, the current state of the robot. And then we have, we go to the second layer. So we query from the position X, Y from the first layer to the second layer. And then we do the same uh, for the next layer. So we can either have two different CPPNs or we can have additional inputs to the CPPN that gives you the layer. I mean, we can imagine many variations of this and I don't think we, we know the best way. And in that specific experiment, uh, it did work. Uh, so again, it's not compared to modern algorithms because the paper is uh, 10 year old, um, but it worked better than many uh, other approaches at the time, including uh, policy gradient uh, descent, uh, Nelder mean simplex and a few uh, hill climbing ideas. So uh, the key point here is that what we find here is that we try to find things that are naturally symmetric, like patterns and things like this, that's symmetric with variations. So try to find patterns more, more than uh, individual weights. Uh, so I think that would be mostly it for this section about neural evolution. There is a very good paper um, by Ken Stanley, Jeff Kloon, Joel Lehman, and Risto Mikulainen about all of this. Uh, we gave the link. Unfortunately, I don't think it's freely available on archive, but there are like uh, unofficial links that you can easily find. Um, that will give you a, a view from uh, these ideas from Nietzsche, so which are like much before deep neural networks, so they are somewhat old ideas, to uh, modern evolutionary strategies uh, for neural evolution, like uh, what uh, Dennis uh, presented before. So that was a very short overview, mostly historical. I don't know if there are uh, questions that Denise did not answer. No, no question. Uh, yeah, so it's possible to do uh, to differentiate neat uh, networks, of course. Uh, but uh, I'm not aware of many work in that direction that has been tried, but uh, I'm not sure it has been very fruitful for me. So uh, if there are no other questions, I will go to the last part of this presentation. I hope the slides will work. Uh, is it okay, Denise, do you see the slide and everything still works? I see the slide, could you try moving it? Yep, we're good. Okay, so let's move uh, to a question that was asked. Um, 
uh, that was asked before about exploration and hard exploration problem. And I would say this is uh, like the main question in evolutionary computation now, but I think is linked to many questions in reinforcement learning, even if it's asked a bit differently. Uh, I think that's a very common underlying question. And I think evolution has some uh, interesting, uh, let's say, research avenues uh, in, for this. So, so, so far we have been trying to convince you that uh, artificial evolution is very cool and very nice and works very well. So we know that uh, evolutionary strategies like, and especially things like CMIS are good global black box optimizers and that works nicely for many reinforcement learning problems. Uh, we know that we can evolve the weights of deep neural networks for reinforcement learning with uh, evolutionary strategies and so on. We have we had a quick overview of multi objective evolution algorithms which I think is a very promising avenue also for reinforcement learning problems. And we quickly look into how to evolve the structure of neural networks like with NIT and IPERD. But uh, it's not that rosy and good. Uh, so it's not really written in the paper. Our papers are always very positive. But behind all these uh, success stories and things like this, there are actually a lot of tuning, fitness shaping, and, and some kind of disappointment because evolution in nature is so much more powerful uh, than finding the weights of a small neural network to solve that games. You see all this diversity of crazy shapes and animals that are all behaving very differently. It's like a very open-ended process and a very creative one. And something that has been very frustrating for us is that if you use a reinforcement learning algorithm or things like evolutionary strategies, you want them for some time, you convert to something and that's it. There is nothing more that is emerging, no new species that starts taking over, no, no actual intelligence behind it. So no creative process, but that's not how real evolution works. So that suggests that there is something that's missing uh, from artificial evolution, some key component that is in nature and that we don't see in all these simplified models of evolution. So things like evolution strategies, which are very useful uh, as optimizers, but essentially is evolution only about optimizing? Uh, how does evolution get all this crazy creativity? And to illustrate this issue, uh, we describe an experiment uh, done uh, by Ken Stanley and Joel Lehman uh, called the pig breeder experiment. So they took these CPPNs that I was describing before uh, to design a tool for the collaborative evolution of images. So the idea is that uh, you go online and you're presented with uh, a few different variations uh, of uh, images that are all encoded by CPPN. So something like what you see uh, on the right of the screen. Uh, for instance, here you see this butterfly and then you have different mutations to it. So different CPPNs. So some mutations might be big, like uh, changing, adding a new connection. Some mutations might not do nothing, like changing a weight that doesn't change anything. And then you ask as a user, uh, to select the one you like. Like uh, you can select one or two or three. And then this bias of selection. So with your, basically the user is acting as a fitness function. And with this, uh, you, uh, you take this mutation that generates new individuals based on the individuals that you prefer. And then you get new, uh, new pictures and so on. And you can play with this for a long time. And you can also start from the design from someone else and see where it goes. And we run this for some time, so we have a, they had a few thousand users, I think, and they get all these crazy images. So a lot of them are very good and it shows that uh, CPPNs are actually very good at encoding patterns. Uh, so some of them are a bit weird, like, uh, but we see uh, lifelike patterns like this butterfly. We see a lot of faces. Uh, we see planets. Uh, we see um, many different objects that we could imagine, like uh, an apple. Um, so this diversity has been amazing. It's just a very small example, yeah, a very small sample, but um, we have like a thousand of these images online. I don't know if the pig breeder website is really working because it was using some Java, old Java software, but uh, if you can look at the images, that's crazy how diverse it is and how interesting. We have tons of very nice uh, drawings that I could not even draw myself, I think. And, and then we said, okay, but that's nice. So actually evolution can get there with interactive evolution. Uh, so it seems that CPPNs can represent uh, uh, this kind of crazy, nice uh, shapes. 
So we look, for instance, at uh, this uh, skull that you see on the top, and we look at the stepping stones. How do we get to this skull that looks like uh, some complicated drawing? And we look at the intermediate generations. And it's fascinating to see that the intermediate generations do not look at all like the final result. And then it's okay, I know that in 74 generations, I can uh, create a CPPN that generate this specific image. So they took NEAT and they said, now I take the fitness function as the distance in pixel space between the current image that generating and the target image, which in that case is a skull. Can I find the skull? Because I know it's possible because interactively people found it. So this genome exists. And this is what we found on the bottom left. Uh, they see nothing that looks like to find a skull. Uh, and that's fascinating because we know it's possible. There is a path that goes there, but the stepping stone, so all the intermediate steps to get there are not at all like the final wizard. That means that when you select for the image that's closest to your target at every time step, even if you explore, even if you have a population and so on, still you earn some local minimum because you have to go far, far away from this, like go to a black image. Then, uh, whereas your final image is mostly white, but you first go to a black image and then you do to an image that looks like, a, I don't know, a clone face. And then at the end, you get uh, this uh, skull face. So uh, they said that that actually reminds us a lot of things about, about what we call deceptive search spaces. So which is a way to, to say that there are some attractive uh, local minima uh, that, that makes the search space very difficult. So it's, it's quite fundamental, I should say, because it's one of the basic heuristic of most search algorithms. So might be reinforcement learning algorithm, evolutionary algorithms, uh, most optimization algorithms, they say that if you're closer to the solution, you should be better. But in many situations, like in the images before, uh, if not the case, you have to go far away from some time before going, being able to find the solution. So we designed a simple problem to illustrate this. So this is what we call the deceptive maze. So the maze, there is a goal, which is a cross, uh, you have a small robot, like a mobile robot that is moving in the maze. And the maze is set up so that if you go in the direction of the goal directly, you cannot go to the goal. So this, this is deceptive because if you reward your individuals from being close to the, to the goal, then you never get there. Instead, you have to take a long path and explore to the right so that finally you get the, uh, actual, um, <coughs> the, the, actual, the actual goal. So here the reward is a distance to the goal at the end of the episode. So we simulate the robot for some time with a small neural network and we see if we can get there. And with objective-based search, it never works. I tried, uh, it's very hard to get to a solution. So what they propose is something that they call novelty search. Uh, the radical idea of novelty search is to say, what if we completely ignore the fitness function and we just search for novel things? So we do some kind of pure exploration. But exploration just in the genotype space is just random search, so that's not very interesting. The second thing that we introduced is we do exploration of the novel behaviors. So general idea is that, uh, as I said before, the trajectory matters more than the genotype and the parameter space. So you will start by doing simple things like the robot spins on itself, the robot moves forward. And after a while, all the easy behavior will be exhausted, like you already did them. So something novel would be something more interesting, like uh, turning right, uh, maybe opening the door. And then after this, something more interesting might be, I don't know, something very creative because you already did all the non-creative and simple things. So <laughs> they introduced this idea of comparing the individuals by uh, behavior distance. And then they say, just ignore the fitness and see if we replace the fitness by a score for novelty in the behavior space. So we keep an archive of all the behaviors that we have seen before. Uh, so that's something that grows, so it does not scale indefinitely. Uh, but with a proper uh, structure, you can uh, have something that scales reasonably well. And then the novelty score is essentially the density around the specific behavior. So you take the individual, you look at the closest like the eight uh, closest individual individuals in the behavior space. So in the archive, you look at all the individuals, uh, their behavior, you compare to it, you look for the closest um, neighbors. And then we sum 
So we do a sum over like the 10 closest individuals. That gives you an estimate of the density. And the best individual, so the one with the best fitness, which is not the fitness anymore, but now has a novelty, is uh, the individual that has uh, the, the, that is in the less dense part of the behavior space. And uh, it works amazingly well. Uh, so you see the plot on, on the right in just uh, one of the generations, then we get to the goal. And somehow it's, it's, it's magic because it's so simple and tells us that maybe just looking at the things that are closer to the goal is not the right heuristic. Maybe, maybe it's a mistake. <clears throat> so to compare the two in single objective and two objectives, phase one that doesn't work at all. The other one is ignoring the fitness and we get a better fitness at the end, uh, which is very counterintuitive. So just a few more examples like this. On the left, you see the fitness. On the right, you see the novelty. And each time you, you get very quickly uh, to the best behavior. And once you, you get this, it's still trying to explore because yeah, it, it, it gets to the goal, but that's not uh, the end of it. Maybe there is a better goal somewhere else. So it still explores and explores in the behavior space. And it can also work for evolving neural networks for uh, more complex tasks like walking because walking is also deceptive in the same way, especially if you do bipod walking. If you like uh, uh, fall forward, that's a very attractive um, optimum, like uh, because if you fall forward, your body is moving like one meter forward. And that's very good because that's much better than anything else that you can achieve at the beginning. But with novelty, you don't say, I want to move forward. You say, my behavior is a position of the center of mass at the end of the episode. So that's fine if you don't move much. Maybe if you go backward or if, but at the beginning, the robot moves like falls. And then it says that, but if I want to do something different, maybe I should just stay up because it's not falling. Uh, of course, it's not good for in terms of uh, fitness, in terms of reward, because it's not moving forward. But at the same time, uh, it's a very useful stepping stone if you actually want to achieve bipedal walking. And after a while it says, but now I've been standing is fine. I know how to do it. Uh, falling is fine, I know how to do it, so what's next? And then it starts moving forward because that's the best thing that you can do if you want to explore more in this behavioral space. And then you see actual fit, actual uh, behavior that are much better uh, than the one evolved by following the fitness gradient. So again, that's interesting because it's simple and counterintuitive, uh, that not looking at the reward is actually better if you explore in the behavioral space. Of course, it's not exploring blindly in the parameter space. It's everything is in this uh, way of um, describing the behavior. So, so uh, I, I found this very insightful, but still I think uh, we still want the fitness and uh, so we still want to, to optimize our problem. And I think it was exploring, but then you're just doing exploration. So maybe you will be at the end rewarded by finding something very cool. But does not really capture what nature uh, is doing because nature does not have like a, an archive of all the previous uh, behaviors and just try to compare to something novel. Uh, so we proposed another algorithm that has been uh, very interesting, uh, which is called MapEdit, which I think is closer um, to, to nature in many respects in terms of evolution but also is uh, given us many new uh, ideas uh, about how to do things differently. So um, the general ideas is that we want to find many good ways of solving a problem instead of a single one. And there are two reasons for this. First, maybe it's very useful to have many good ways of solving a problem because maybe solving the problem in specific way uh, is not working for you for other reasons. Like uh, maybe it's too expensive, Maybe you maybe it does not work like on a real machine. Maybe maybe you don't like it. Like it's not beautiful. I don't know. Uh, but also because that will create a lot of stepping stones. So the way we do it is that we um, divide the behavior space into small cells. So you can imagine a grid like what we have on the left. Mm -hmm. So we take behavioral dimensions. So we use these behavioral distances as before. We can describe an individual, for instance with two behavioral dimensions, but would be the X, Y position at the end of the episode. That could be one way of defining the behavior. We can find others, we would be higher dimensional, but that's still possible. Uh, so we divide this in a grid, and basically we decide that every cell in this grid is a niche. So one could be like the equivalent of an elephant, like solving it in a specific way, like by, a walk, by being very heavy, walking and eating um, 
uh, grass, for instance. Another one would be still solving the same problem, like uh, survival, uh, but it will be solving the same problem in a different way, maybe by eating other animals like a leopard uh, and living more in trees. So it's occupying a different niche. It's still the best of its niche, but uh, it's, uh, it's different. So it's not competing with lions, like leopards usually do not eat lions. And then you have other niches like fishes. They are very good in their niche. They are behaving in a specific way. So they are living in a specific environment, they're behaving, they eat specific things and so on, but they are still the best fish for a specific niche, like in the specific um, behavioral space. So we define this and the goal will be to find the best species for each of these niches, the best individual for each of these uh, cells. And the algorithm then is very simple. Uh, we select uh, one or two or several elites. Uh, so one or two species that are in the niches we add some random genetic variation. Uh, we do uh, some, uh, we evaluate the fitness. And from the fitness, we get two things. We get the fitness and we get the behavior. So the behavior is like the trace uh, of what has been done during the episode. And as I said at the beginning, evolution usually does not use this, but reinforcement learning tend to use this trace. Here we're using it to compare behaviors, to define if two behaviors are the same. Uh, using this behavior, we determine the niche, and then there is a competition. We look at the fitness of the individual that is already in this niche, and if the new individual is better, then we replace uh, the current individual by the new one, the current species by the new one, and if it's uh, worse, then we just discard the newly created um, uh, species. So this is, in my mind, much closer to natural evolution, but it's still a very simple algorithm. I mean, it's just a small modification uh, and somewhat it's less exhaustive than novel research. It's not trying to only explore, it's trying to, to find good solutions. So it's still guided um, by the reward, uh, but it's doing things uh, a bit differently. So let's take a concrete example. So there is a notebook for this. Uh, I don't suggest you go to the notebook directly. It's more like for future reference, but if you want, you can try. Uh, I think it's should have been given uh, in the chat somewhere, otherwise the URL is here. But basically, uh, uh, I'm not sure the notebook will uh, run easily for you. Uh, so let's take a simple example. We have a planar arm. So in robotics, this are uh, like this, um, this arm on the left that are sometimes used in manufacturing, uh, in which you, you move in a plane and then you can pick up something. You can generalize this by having um, many other degrees of freedom. And our genotype will be uh, the angles uh, of uh, every joint. So if we have three joints, then we have three genes. Uh, so three parameters that define a specific uh, position. And the behavior space will be the position of the end effector. So that's a very toy problem that's useless. In uh, robotics, you will use inverse kinematics to solve all of this, of course. Uh, but it's to illustrate with something that's easy in a notebook, uh, what we're trying to achieve. So by moving the joints, as you see on the video, uh, you can uh, move the robot and you move the end effector. So the search space is n-dimensional, so the number of joints, and the behavior space here is two-dimensional. It's a position of the end effector. So when we define the fitness, and what we decided is that we like when uh, all the joints have similar value. It's like a smooth position. Uh, it's purely arbitrary. Again, it's a toy problem. Uh, but the general idea of this would be to say that we want to spread the effort uh, on all the joints. So we define the fitness here, which is simply the standard deviation of the genotype. Uh, and then your fitness function will uh, scale up uh, to zero to pi to get uh, the position, angular position. And then we call a simulator that computes the forward kinematics uh, of the robot. We normalize this uh, just for, because it's simpler in the algorithm. So we put uh, the behavior in zero one. So we assume that the robot is moving in a, in a plane that is defined by zero one. And we return both the fitness, so this uh, standard deviation and the position of the live joint. Then we implement map edits. So the first thing is that we try, is we start with random solutions. So we define the species class, uh, which is essentially a species is a genotype, a behavior, a fitness, and the niche coordinate. With all of this, we have a specification of a niche. Mm -hmm. And to add an archive, so if we have a current archive, so a current, a current uh, map of uh, species, 
to know if a new solution needs to be added, there are two places. Either the, the cell is actually, the niche is actually empty, so we automatically add a new individual to it, or uh, the species um, is, uh, the niche is already occupied. So in that case, we compare the fitness function and we take the best one. <coughs> so uh, that's what you see in the function add to archive. Uh, we look at what is the current uh, species. So it's simply uh, discretizing the behavior and then we compare the fitness. So to initialize, we do just do random solutions and we add them sequentially to the archive. Uh, and then you get uh, the kind of maps that you see on the right, uh, which are uh, just a few individuals. You see yellow is means that they have a bit of fitness. And you see that a few examples of the arm on the bottom. So some of them are like more regular and they all reach different positions. So you see like the, the circle is the end position. So that defines the niche. And when you see the arm with different colors. So now we can run map it. So I said it's a very, very simple algorithm. Uh, we do a loop. So we do batches just for our visualization, but we don't need to do batches here. We pick up a random individual uh, from the current archive. Uh, we add some mutation. So in that case, it's just some uh, normal uh, noise. So we tap uh, some Gaussian noise around the current solution. We compute the fitness. And then we try to add to the archive. And very quickly, you will see uh, this kind of things happen. So first, the archive is filled quickly. So we want to cover all uh, the different niches. You don't see anything in the corners because the arm uh, you know, if you extend fully, you will uh, never reach the corners because it's too far. So you see the workspace of the arm. Uh, you see that uh, the fitness landscape in that case is not perfectly uniform because there are positions for which you have to compromise. You cannot have like a perfect standard deviation, like the same value of all the joints to reach any position. You essentially can link, can reach a, a, like some kind of circle around you, but there are positions for which you need to uh, like uh, bend the arm uh, in the right way. So you see on the bottom uh, the final map that is found after a few thousand generations. Uh, you can run this in the notebook too. And you see that the solutions that we find on the bottom left are quite regular. But of course, if you want to go to the zone that actually uh, is not possible to reach with a purely regular position, uh, you see that the, it's blue. So that means that the fitness of the best uh, species here is, is low. And that's because you have to have one joint that has a very different values from the others. Otherwise, you cannot reach this position. That's an artifact of the way we, we write the problem. Again, that's just a toy example. And if we compare this to what we had at the beginning, of course, the map was not filled, but also we see that the arms didn't have regular position at all compared to what we have uh, on the bottom left. So in this very simple algorithm, uh, we, we get all these good solutions and not a single one. Um, very quickly, because I see that uh, we are already eating the time on the, uh, on, uh, the, the break. Uh, why does it work? And why is it more interesting? Why is it especially interesting, I would say? Is that usually good solutions are related. So they are behaving differently, but they actually share a lot of common things. And in nature, but we know that like human and food flies, which occupy very different niches, they are, they are so different in terms of the way they live, uh, the way they live and, and the way uh, they, they look and so on, but still they share 60% of their genes. And that makes sense because they also use cells, they also use neurons. Uh, there are many things that are common. So it's the same in, uh, in map edits. You occupy very different behavioral -like niches, but at the same time, once you have found a good solution, uh, it, the recipe for another good solution might not be that far. So you can reuse the stepping stone as a knowledge that you use to build a specific behavior, maybe to occupy a different uh, behavioral niches. So that's what we tried here with a two-dimensional arm because two dimension we can visualize um, the, the genomes. Um, so it's the same problem as before, except that we're in 2D here. So on the bottom row on the plot of the right, you see the genes, so at the beginning they're well spread, uh, and on the top you see the map generated by MapEdit. And what's very insightful here is that you see that the shape occupied by the genomes at the end is not well spread. So we are very well spread in the behavior space, but not well spread at all in the genome space. And this has a very specific shape, uh, very quite complicated, I would say, but very specific one. So we can exploit this uh, by adding back crossover. 
So if we take two points from an existing uh, volume uh, and we want to generate something that is still in this volume, so something that is likely to be a good solution too. Uh, so we take two random points and we put something in between. If the volume is convex, so the volume in the genome space that corresponds to all the good solutions, uh, then we're very likely to get one. So uh, if it's a pure convex uh, volume, that's easy. If it's not purely convex, it's not guaranteed to work, but still you're likely to get something that is a good solution too. So by adding a simple crossover, which is essentially taking two individuals and putting a new individual randomly in the line in between them, uh, then we can significantly uh, in, um, improve the result. So we had this simple thing here. So in the same algorithm, except that we pick up two random individuals and then the mutation is some Gaussian noise plus something that corresponds to uh, picking a point in between uh, the two parts. And you see the pictures here, uh, the two pixels on the left. On the left is the one with this uh, new uh, crossover-like idea. And on the right, you see the one that we generated just before with just the mutation. So there is a clear improvement with very simple idea. And crossover is a very old idea in, uh, in evolutionary computation. But here, I think we're doing something a bit different because we are enforcing this behavioral diversity. So it looks the same, but I think fundamentally it might be a bit more powerful and more important here. Uh, still, it, it improves the results very nicely. Uh, I want to do very quickly that you might have heard of something called Go Explore, which is an algorithm that was just published in Nature, but we, we had an archive version for a few years and, uh, before, which takes this concept of map edits and push it to do exploration in reinforcement learning. So the behavior space is a state traverse, so something like um, a low resolution uh, version of the image that is reached by the agent. And the fitness is the number of time steps to reach this specific uh, state. So like if you can reach, uh, like you climb a ladder, uh, or maybe, maybe if you go first right, turn right, and so on, and then you climb the ladder, or maybe you go directly. And the one we keep in the archive is the one uh, that, that goes up directly. There are a few more additions. So once it's explored, go explore. Uh, so it explores with something very close to map edit. And then uh, you can, uh, once you know the path to which a good solution, then you can learn a neural network that will imitate this uh, with a more classic uh, wave for smart learning algorithms. And uh, it has been working very, very well in uh, many, many of the hard Gatai games. So if you did not read this paper, you can, should read it, but also, uh, it started with this idea of map edits and then uh, they diverged, of course, and added many other things. So a few more other ideas about current work about all of this. Uh, we can scale up to high-dimensional behavior spaces. So instead of having a grid, uh, we can divide the, the space uh, with a centroidal for a noise tessellation. So that's essentially a computer graphics way of splitting a high-dimensional volume into cells of equal volume. And we can use this as a grid. We can use distance based archive. Uh, we can also try to use uh, variational autoencoders to try to reduce the dimensionality of the behavior space. We have been working on scaling up to high dimensional genotype space, uh, like learn via hyper volume. So, this idea of uh, what is the VCP of good solution with a variational autoencoder. And we can use surrogate models, uh, something we we'll discuss this afternoon, uh, to try to improve data efficiency. So, just to give you some pointers if you're interested. So a few examples before concluding on this part. Uh, here we're searching for many ways of working. So the behavior space is six dimensional and is a percentage of time steps for which each foot has been in contact uh, with the floor. You can imagine many other different ways of defining uh, behavior here. We look at, for instance, the angle of the body, uh, like is it tilted forward, backward, and so on. The search space here is 36 parameters. So it's a basic open loop controller. But here what we are looking for are many different ways of working. So that's why it's interesting. It's not only about finding the best way of working, it's finding the best way of working uh, by not using the first leg, the best way of working uh, by uh, using uh, only uh, the back legs, the best way of limping. So it's much more diverse at the end. It's many ways of solving the same problem. And you see a lot of creativity here, uh, much more uh, than if you were just uh, optimizing for working distance, which, which we get very good working 
controllers. But we get many, many of them, and that's much more interesting uh, for us to see all this diversity. So you see all the diversity here. I think you can uh, find asymmetric behaviors and so on. Uh, there also, there was a cell in which we said we have a zero zero cell in which the feet uh, never touched the ground, and it found even a solution for this. So, here yeah, this one is uh, not using the feet at all. So, it found a way that uh, by um, rolling like this, and then it could work, so still have a good fitness and have a uh, um, and have a good uh, not touching the floor, so feeling uh, the behavioral niche. So here we have a 6D map. So the result of this algorithm at the end uh, are this large map of solutions in which every pixel here is a different policy uh, that is working, and each of them is the best one of their family. And we see this afternoon how uh, we can use this in robotics. So it's also a good, uh, actually, optimization algorithm. Antoine uh, Cully recently. Uh, try to compare this to PPO. And if you use uh, just this algorithm uh, with a small neural network, so two hidden layers of six, six neurons, uh, then you get um, sometimes better or comparable uh, performance as PPO. So it's actually a good optimizer. You can use this, for instance, for instance to evolve uh, shapes, uh, diverse shapes here for um, benchmarking. So you try to find many shapes that are difficult, that have different levels of difficulty for grasping with a robotic arm and different complexity. And if you do this, then you get like an ideal benchmark, something that allows you uh, to, to try different techniques and see how they rank uh, with the diversity of objects. So that's a recent paper, some colleagues in Australia, and then they 3D print the objects and try them uh, with uh, the robot. We also use this to evolve airfoils. And here the idea is that um, airfoils is a classic problem in a uh, aerodynamics. So it's not interesting by itself, but it was to evolve shapes. And here, really, it's important that you, instead of giving to a designer, this is the best solution. You say, these are many interesting solutions. Pick the one you like using your own expertise. So maybe the designer would say, I know that this airfoil is more effective, like it has a better performance, but I know I cannot build it because with current carbon fiber, it's too thin. And then you can pick up something else that's still good, uh, but it's different. So given this diversity of solutions uh, allows someone to pick up the one that they think is good according to their own expertise. And just to finish, uh, we started with this uh, scale problem. So we said that MAPIS could generate much better uh, stepping stones. So we try to see if we set the fitness as this finding this scale, we use CPPN in the same way as before. We know that with pure NEAT, we don't find anything. Uh, do we find something with map edits? And we don't find the perfect skull, but we do find skulls. So there is a much better improvement here. That means that we have an algorithm that generates much more interesting stepping stones because you see on the right the kind of skulls we get. Uh, so none of them are perfect. So I'm quite disappointed that we didn't perfectly solve the problem, but still they start to look like skulls. Uh, so that's much better uh, than the pure objective based search. And that's really interesting because that means that these behavioral niches are creating interesting stepping stones. And if you look at the stepping stones with MapEdit to get there, you see the same kind of patterns as what we have seen with Big Breeder, so with interactive evolution. You see that the intermediate steps are very far from the final image that we evolve. So uh, again, I think that's a, a very promising uh, direction. So a few readings, uh, if you want to do, to look into this. Uh, I wrote recently a paper that gives an overview of this idea. Um, and uh, you should also look at the book by uh, Kat Slaney and Joel Lehman, uh, Why Greatness Can Be Planned. It's a small book. It's not really a scientific book. It's more like uh, an essay about uh, why both in learning, but also in life and in organization of society and so on, focusing on short-term objective is, can be very, very bad. And we need to think differently. So a few words of conclusion for all this uh, part, because I think we have the keynote, we have a break and then the keynote. Uh, so the main message is as uh, evolutionary strategies uh, are good black box optimizers and they can work nicely for reinforcement learning problems. So current evolutionary strategies are simple and robust, especially compared to modern uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. So 
I think, especially when you take uh, into account things like um, the Mojo code tasks so or this simple control task, uh, they are very easy to set up and they work very well. Maybe they are not like the best of the best, um, but they are so easy to set up compared to other approaches that they are worth uh, having a look at. Uh, we can evolve the weights of deep neural networks for reinforcement learning. Uh, it has been a surprise for us, this kind of large scale optimization. Uh, again, with such a simple algorithm, being able to achieve sometimes the best score is already, I think, very inspiring. Uh, I think there are a lot of things to do with multi-objective algorithms uh, because then they find many solutions that are Pareto optimal trade-offs. So instead of aggregating everything in a single cost function with many weights, you get all these nice trade-offs and then you can pick up the one you like uh, or you can uh, have much switch output from your algorithm. So we can evolve the structure of neural networks. So that's what we see with NEED, HyperNEED, but there are many others. But I think the way, really what's, um, what is interesting for us right now is that this question is how to explore and identify the good stepping stones. That's a key question. And that's a question for anything in learning, for everything that's like sparse rewards and things like this. And I think evolution has been thinking about this for a long time uh, with very different perspectives. So algorithms that are quite simple and elegant, uh, maybe not very data efficient, but that look at the problem quite differently. So especially MapEdits takes inspiration from behavioral niches and we see a lot of creativity, interesting results uh, and an output with many high performing solutions, many ways of performing a task that can be very useful in many ways. So this afternoon I will show a few ways in robotics, uh, but I think in many situations, just giving like this is the best solution and stopping there is actually not what people want if they want to use learning or optimization algorithms. Uh, they are much happier when we propose alternatives. So when we get, here are 10,000 good solutions, if you like, they're all very good, all are optimized, but then you can choose. You can use your own insight, your own inspiration to take the one, to pick the one you like. And for concrete applications of learning, I think that's would be very useful. Uh, 